I don't know if my reps told you this, but while I was filming the third season, um, I discovered your videos on YouTube because I live on YouTube and I'm obsessed with the real world. So I was watching your interviews with like, you did Camila, which I think was like one of my favorite. Yes. Like you, you interviewed a bunch of people. So I was like obsessed. So when this came through, I was like, um, yeah, I have to talk to Jess because I love that show so much. <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. Thank you. Yeah, I had a Mohammed on from San Francisco mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, that was a really good one as well. Oh my God. So this was while you were shooting the third season? Um, but I, I live on YouTube. Like I spend so so much time on YouTube. It's like, it's my procrastination tool. It is a place for me to conduct research um, on new stories. It is where I go when I need to decompress. Like it just, it has so many functions mm -hmm. and uses. And so anyway, um, while we were filming our third season of the show, anytime I had like a, a break, whether it was like between setups or like, you know, if we had like a lunch hour, like I would go into my office and I would just, I always pop onto YouTube and that's just the place I go to. And so anyway, um, in the process of that, that's how I discovered your show. And so I was like, okay, cool. And I was loving it. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> um, all right, let's just, uh, let's just jump right in. Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. This is Jess and I am here with the Emmy nominated co-creator executive producer, writer, and director of my absolute favorite scripted series for the past three years, Pose. It's Stephen Canals. Hey, Stephen. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's a the finale was so impactful. And I actually think it's one of the best series finales of any show I've ever seen. Oh, truthfully. Thank you. Wow. Truthfully. That means a lot. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get into I mean, this is like major spoiler alert. Like I wanna we're gonna go into all of the plot of everything. But to start off, I really want this to be a deep dive on how the show is created, the houses, how the ballroom culture scene works, that community, um, Madonna's impact, everything. So we're gonna touch on all of those things. So to kick off, tell me how, what year did you write your original pilot, the original screenplay, and how did it wind up in the hands of Ryan Murphy to actually get mm. produced? So I'm going to take you back to 2004. Uh, I was an undergrad student uh, studying cinema at Binghamton University, and I saw Paris is Burning for the first time, and it rocked my world you know this is jenny livingston's beautiful documentary that was released in 1991 uh and this was a doc that she filmed over the course of three years it was like 1980 i think 86 to 89 uh and she she just was documenting all of the intricacies and the beauty and the individuals who are part of the harlem ballroom community and obviously this was in New York City in the midst of both the HIV AIDS and crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. But I had never seen up until that point, black and Latin, queer and trans people on screen. Like literally had never seen it other than RuPaul who had a major hit, you know, in the mid nineties. I, I just, I'd never seen that before. I was, I was so blown away by what I was seeing on screen. And I think the reason why it was so moving was also that my parents grew up in Harlem. So anyway, where, um, where were you when you when you like did you see this in the theater or did you discover this on on VHS no I was taking a class I was enrolled in a course called film theory oh wow and okay. yeah my professor was like you know this is that we have this really beautiful documentary that I want to show you and you know she was just like a really great she was like she was a young cool hip professor she was working on her PhD at Cornell at that point and she was just very subversive in a way that other professors in my program weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that she was leaning into intersectionality. I mean, she was an Asian woman and I think that probably had something to do with it. Um, but she was like, we're gonna highlight what it means to be black or Latin and also be queer and trans. 
so I watched this documentary, Rocks My World, um, I very vividly, and this is no lie, remember walking back to my residence hall or dorm room and where I was an RA thinking that would make a really great television show. And immediately I heard the name Damon and I was, as a kid, I always loved flash dance. Yes. So I remember thinking, oh, it could be about this young kid who moves to New York and wants to become a dancer and gets enmeshed in this war between two house mothers. That's all it was. Kernel of an idea, put it away. At that point, I thought I was going to be a director. I had no interest in becoming a screenwriter. So that's all it was. Cut to 10 years later. So this is now end of 2013. I'm in my second year in the UCLA MFA screenwriting program. And I enroll in a drama pilot course. And you have to pitch two ideas to get into the class. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I... I was like, I don't have anything. And I remember like sort of in a flash, the, you know, this idea comes back to me and I think, oh, I should, you know, I'll put it on paper. We'll see. I don't know. Um, I just needed something so I can get into the class. But I get into the course and pitch that idea, po what ultimately became posed with another idea. And everybody just went crazy over pose. And so I thought, okay, well, I guess I'll write it. So I wrote it at the very beginning of 2014. What was the the initial working title? Or was it always Pose? It was always called Pose, which I was very proud of, by the way, because if you go back to that original draft that I wrote while I was at UCLA, the right after the cover page, um, I actually defined the word Pose because it's both a noun and a verb. And so I defined the word. And for me, it was like, it was a double entendre because it's not just about the posing that they're doing on the ballroom floor, but posing that we do in our everyday lives. And so to me that, you know, I, I really loved it. And I was excited when I met Ryan that he also loved the title and decided we should keep it. How does it, winds up in, how does it wind up in the hands of Ryan Murphy? So I write that first draft beginning of 2014. Immediately it starts circulating within the industry. Um, and that journey lasted between finishing the first draft and meeting Ryan Murphy was two and a half years. The, as I would put it, the script was opening every door for me, but it wasn't keeping me in rooms. So it was great. You know, I signed with my managers, agents, I got staffed on a television show, like everything that a, you know, I guess what we would call like a, your calling card when you're working on a degree in screenwriting or, you know, for any person who lives in LA who wants to break into the industry as a writer, you know, they always tell you, you have to write your calling card, write the thing that the industry can't deny. Um, so the script was doing that, but in terms of the show itself, couldn't find anybody who wanted to invest in it. So, from the moment I wrote it and signed with my managers until I met Sherry Marsh, who was the executive producer who introduced me to Ryan Murphy, I had 160, 166 meetings over the course of two and a half years. Sherry Marsh being 167. She, I meet her, we have a two hour, because usually your general meetings in the industry are about 45 minutes to an hour. It's, you know, I, we call it the water bottle tour because everyone offers you a bottle of water. It's <laughs> you kind of talking about who you are, what you do, you know, you may or may not talk about the writing, you know, and then it's like, well, thanks, you know, we'll talk to you again soon. Um, and when I was going into these meetings, more times than not, you know, execs were telling me, we really love the, your voice on the page. We love the script. We think it's really exciting. What else have you got? Or we'll keep you in mind for other projects that we're developing. But really, I couldn't find anyone who wanted to develop specifically in Pose. And so I meet with Sherry Marsh. We have a two-hour meeting, which already in itself is sort of odd because more, usually these meetings don't last that long. But at the end of it, she was like, I really want us to find something to work on together. And so in the course of talking, I discover she knows what ballroom is um, because she was developing something at that point with a trans woman who used to be part of the ballroom community. And so I was shocked because I was like, oh, you know what ballroom is. And I'm like, you well, you should read this pilot that I have. So I send it to her on a Friday, Monday morning. She's like, we have to go out with this. This is more than a sample. This is a television show. And you know, I had an actual proper producer behind me. And so we pitched it. And in the, about a week and a half into pitching the show, Sherry, Marsh gets a phone call 
Um, and the phone call was from Ryan Murphy saying, I heard that you're out with this project with a new writer, send me the script, I wanna meet this person. What we didn't know, and this is what, uh, this is what led to, to Ryan re reaching out is that Ryan had been working on acquiring the rights to Paris is Burning to develop it into a television show. And I guess as he, as he tells the story, he had hit a couple of roadblocks along the way in terms of developing it into a show. And so he reached out to me because he was like, oh, well, there's there's someone out there with a ballroom show. And one of the things that he said to me when we met in that, because we had one 45 minute meeting and at the end of it, Ryan's like, we're going to make that together, which was shocking to me. Um, but when we met, one of the things that he said was that he he didn't think that it made sense for the two of us to go out with competing projects. He was like, let's be honest, like there really isn't enough space for queer and trans narratives in the industry. And so the fact of the matter is that if we're both telling a story that takes place in the same world, he was like, one of these two projects isn't gonna go, why don't we just partner up and do it together? Which, you know, it's, I mean, it's Ryan Murphy. I love that. Wow. And what was he at the at the time it landed uh landed with him? What was he working on at that time? He was working on the pilot for Feud, which was the limited series starring yes. Jessica Lange and Susan Sarandon. He literally walked wow. he was filming the pilot that day. So he leaves set on the Fox lot to come to his office to meet with me for 45 minutes you wrote so did you guys then re rewrite the pilot together or was it pretty much as is your your last draft of it no so I, I well I'm a I'm a Virgo so I'm neurotic so I'm perpetually rewriting things mm -hmm. which you know I think if you do a Google search you can find a draft of my original post pilot but it's like I was constantly changing it so mm -hmm. there's so many drafts that I'm like Ugh. whenever I, I hear people like oh I found it I'm like well you found one of it <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway when I meet with Ryan and Brad for the first time to start breaking story in the room because originally it was just the three of us and Ryan's process is like whoever the creators are let's write the first two episodes let's really get down into the mud and understand who these characters are, what the world is, then we'll put a room together. Because by by then we've written two episodes, we have a sense of who the characters are, what the show is, you know, as opposed to finding it with like a lot too many voices. Yeah. So we go in the room, we start breaking it. Immediately Ryan's like, I kind of want to go back to thinking about the show as a faithful adaptation of the documentary. And I'm like, okay, that works. So we end up writing a draft. So that's draft number two is the Paris is Burning draft where, you know, Dorian Corey and Peppa La Beja um, are all characters in the show. Were you using we their, then... were you using their, their real names? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we, okay. it was a little, it was a very faithful adaptation of the documentary. The, the, the problem with doing that is that you're now basing a narrative on real people. And so you don't have as much freedom to make things up. Yeah. The other thing is I reached out to a couple of the family members um, of some of the folks, because a, a, a lot of the people from Paris is Burning have passed away. Mm -hmm. um, I think by that point, there were only three folks from the doc who are still living um, in terms of principal folks who were highlighted in the documentary. And so I reached out to a couple of family members and basically everyone was like, we have no desire to talk to you. We're good. Like do what you want to do, but we're, we don't want to be involved, which made it really hard. Cause we're like, how do we, you know, we, we don't want to make up stuff about these people's lives. And so, so Ryan says, okay, let's go back to your original draft. So we go back to my original draft and we reconceptualize some things there. So that's draft four. Now in that draft, this will be a fun fact. Uh, Donald Trump is a character on the show. So we were, so he was, he was omnipresent in New York at that time. You know, this is like the eighties and then he, you know, he ran for president and then he won. And we were like, uh, you know, we just didn't want to give him any more attention or shine. Mm -hmm. So we ended up taking a lot of incorporating a lot of that fourth draft with Trump. Um, he, that character sort of morphed into the character that James Vanderbeek plays mm -hmm. uh, Matt. So we take out Trump, we, we then decide to make it Vanderbeek's character, Matt. And then we start writing the second episode. And it was while we were writing the second episode that Ryan Murphy comes into the room 
one day and says to me, I think, well, to, to Brad and I, he goes, I think we've been breaking the show all wrong. And if you read my original draft, it was very dark. There's a murder. And Ryan was like, I just think that there's something missing here. And that something missing is like the familial element. And he was like, you, when you talk about being a queer person of color, you talk about it with so much joy. And he was like, I just want to feel that joy on the page. Okay. And so we went back to the pilot and that's when we wrote. So the fifth, what would have become the fifth draft, which is what you see on screen now, which is just, it's a family show. It's very focused on Blanca, where I think the original drafts were really focused heavily on Damon and his journey. Mm. We make Blanca the main character and the show becomes about a family and it's just, it's, it's joy. And we don't lean out of the darkness um, but we really ramped up the the family element and the happiness. Before we jump into the whole casting process, which I really want to find out like where all of these people came from, because I know a lot of them came from the actual ballroom community. Can you really explain what ballroom culture is and why it became such a salvation for so many young people at that time? Mm-hmm. Um, a salvation and a safety net. And to be clear, it still is, you know, I get that question a lot. Like, you know, I wish I could have been alive to attend balls in those days. And it's like, you can still attend a ball now. Ballroom is still thriving and it's global. And it's, it's an important intervention and safety net for young, for young people, regardless of identity, but really for young queer and trans people. Um, so the ballroom came out of in the late sixties, or I guess throughout the sixties, uh, there were these, drag competitions that used to take place. They were a lot like our modern day, like Miss America. Um, mm -hmm. And they were primarily drag queens. I think at that time, there were probably some folks who also identified as like genderqueer or trans. They just didn't have that language then. Um, but those drag, those drag competitions were always dominated by white drag queens. Um, and so there really wasn't a lot of space for for people of color, specifically black folks. And so if you go back, there's an incredible documentary called The Queen that was released in the late, I think 1969. Um, and it's, it focuses on a, a, one of these drag competitions. And there is a black queen named Crystal LaBeja who is incredible and beautiful and wonderful and is in one of these competitions and doesn't win mm -hmm. and highlights the fact that, oh, I, I didn't win because I'm black, that's mm -hmm. why. Crystal LaBeja goes off and is the first person to create, to form a house, you know? So she, in, in essence, dubs herself a mother um, and, and then she adopts a bunch of children um, to be part of her home. And so, you know, again, Crystal, at that time, the intention was to create an intervention, was to say there are young people who are being rejected by their homes, by the government, by schools, you know, and I want to make sure that there's a safety and that there's someone there who's looking out for them, someone who's looking to support them. In the early to mid 70s, a couple of other uh, queens begin creating their own houses. Um, you know, so along with Crystal LaBeja, you have like Dorian Corey was another person mm -hmm. who created a house. And so you have all these houses start to pop up in like the late seventies. Um, it just so happens that they all migrate or are located in New York city. And so that's where the Harlem house scene sort of begins. And out of the house scene, I think as like a nod to, and I'm not an expert on this, but, um, I think it was it has to do with the way that you know the the white queens have been competing in these drag competitions that's where ballroom sort of come like forms so all of these houses decide oh we're gonna just throw these like big fets you know and and at that time it's interesting because on pose like we make it seem like it happens every weekend the reality is if you talk to folks who were alive at that time in the 80 in early 80s and mid 80s it really was like once every two months you know like they they weren't oh, happening okay. yeah it seems frequently. like it's happening every friday night <laughs> yeah show. like it's yeah. like every friday they're going to a ball and it's like no in reality like it wasn't it wasn't that frequent because it takes a lot of time and effort and work and but um but these balls started popping up these competitions and so within the competition you know or, or within the ballroom community 
you have this opportunity for houses to compete against each other in all these really cool categories rooted in fashion and music and dance. And, um, and even though on our show, like we play it out as like very serious competition and there is some element to that. The reality is that it was all about community. Mm -hmm. You know, it was about family. It was about support. And I think the most important thing to take away both from ballroom and also from what we highlight of ballroom on our show is that it really was a place and we, and Blanca says this in the pilot. um, It was a place to live out the fantasy and the dream of who you want to be as a queer and trans person or as a black and brown queer and trans person in a world that tells you you're not allowed to be that you know so a lot of those categories were coming out of what is my greatest aspiration like what is my hope who do i want to be and who is the world telling me i can't be well, that? that's why it's like the cat you know businesswoman and like all these different that's you know, you know all the different categories um exactly on the show the ball scenes how did you film the ball scenes pre and during COVID, like the first two seasons mm. of the show versus how the hell were you able to film these really crowded scenes full of people during the pandemic? That is a great question. Um, in terms of the, well, pre or post pandemic, I would say the the real key to filming Pose is having buy-in from the ballroom community. So we were really fortunate in that um the ballroom community rallied around us very quickly because it's their story you know Mm -hmm. it's their story to tell and like i've never been a part of ballroom i revere it and and obviously through the show i get to pay homage to it but ultimately i've never walked the ball and and so uh it was great that we had so many incredible consultants during the run of our show and and folks who are part of the ballroom community like leomi maldonado and twiggy pucci garcon who who uh, both served as not only consultants, but they also choreographed throughout our, our three season run. And so a lot of our background actors in the show are actually from the ballroom community. And if you watch the show, every single person who walks in a ballroom category is from ballroom. So we always, so we had a, a young woman, Genovia Chase, who's also part of the ballroom community. And Genovia was our ballroom consultant throughout the run of our show. And she worked really closely with one of our other producers, Tanase Popa, to ensure that we always had all of our, you know, our ballroom always felt really authentic. Did you, so, for research, did you ever, I, I, I'm going to assume that you actually went to balls just to, just for research, just mm-hmm. to, Yeah. And what was yeah? I mean, I, I had attended balls before the show, and obviously, you know, went to ballroom, at, saw balls take place after as well. So, how is it different? I guess how realistic, like what we're seeing on screen, is so fantastical, and of course, that has to do with the way it's shot, it's directed, it's you know, it's movie magic. What are um what are the differences and and similarities between reality and movie magic? That's a great question. Um, It's fascinating. I actually, I think I would recommend anyone who's listening, if they're interested, go watch Paris is Burning. It's it's fascinating, right? I think that one of the things is that our show, it always felt very, um, like our show is very stylized because it's television. Mm -hmm. Um, And we also, we really populate our our ballroom. So, you know, pre-pandemic, we always had anywhere from 125 to 150 background actors. This season, we couldn't have more than 40. So it was like a challenge to shoot those scenes. Um, And so we had to really, you know, be very creative to make it seem populated and full. So how did you, Um, so how did you do that? Like, how did you, how did you navigate through the pandemic specifically with these scenes? uh, Well, two things. One is that we, we had a group, we would bring in a group of 80 background actors on any particular ballroom day. But since the ballroom is an actual set that we built um, on a, on our stages, which are located in the Bronx, what we would do is we would film the scene with 40 people in that space. Mm-hmm. Then we would move those 40 people out, bring a new group of 40 in. And then oh, what nice. we would do is in post, you basically tile, it's something called tiling. Um, where you you start to basically like 
you map where people are in the space. So that way then it just, it appears to be full. Um, you just have to have a, a visual effects person. And our, our visual wow. effects person is this really cool dude, Brian, who would come in and um, you basically have to track like where are your 40 people standing? You would mark the ground with tape and tell them they have to stay within the tape lines. And then you bring another 40 people, give them a new tape line. And so then in, in post, you know, we just visually, you use all your VFX and, and special effects and whatnot to then make it look like there's, you know, 80 or hundred people. It was, it was a lot of work. It just, it took a lot of time. It wasn't hard. It just took a lot more time. So it ate through your day. Cause you're kind of on a, you know, you're on a limited time crunch when you're filming. Um, Since we're on the topic of just like the difficulties of filming this final season, I know I remember when the show premiered. Remember in 2018, yeah. Ryan Murphy said in an interview that he had the first five seasons of the show mapped out. He said, I remember that. He said that in some random interview. And I remember saying to a friend, like, oh my God, this thing is definitely going to go five years. Like, he already says he hasn't mapped out, like, all the time jumps, where it's going to go. Why did the show seemingly get cut short to three seasons? So a couple things. I think one is when I first met with Ryan, that first 45 minute meeting, it was during that conversation. So the way that I had been pitching the show is I always said the show every season was a year in the life of these characters. Um, and my end goal, which Ryan agreed with, so we knew that in that very first meeting was going to be the cocktail being released in 1995, 96. So presumably the show could go, you know, from wherever we were starting it through 95, 96. Um, and then we started time jumping. And I think that's where things shifted significantly for us because in addition to the show being a year in the life of these characters, the other part, the other really important part of my pitch was that I wanted the show to be grounded socio-politically in what was happening in New York City. So like for our audience, they should know that the choice to, to have our, our every season be in a particular year was never arbitrary. There was always a lot of care and consideration put into that. And so when we went in for this third season, once we knew we were going to be, because we ended season two, it was 1992, right? Yeah. So for us, it was like, you know, we know we don't want to go past 95 because obviously that's the end. And so we ended in 92 and we, and we didn't want to do a direct pickup of it either because that's not what we did season one to season two. So we're like, at the very least, we need to do 93. The question then became for me in the writer's room if I know the show's ending 95, 96, and we're picking up nine, in the third season, 93, it's like, so what then is season three? Because I know the end goal is to get us to 95, you know, or 95, 96. Mm -hmm. um, and so it felt to me when we started breaking season three, which was November of 2020, October, October, -ish, November uh, 2020, I was like, I just feel like we're going to wind up creating a filler season. Like every season has had so much intention and, you know, we've really come in with a very clear focus. And I was like, I just couldn't see the forest through the trees. I was like, I just don't know. If I know that the final season is Pray Tell, the journey of Pray Tell, and we had decided during season two that it was Pray Tell who was gonna die. We knew, mm. spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> and we knew that that was, you know, where we were gonna be, like we were barreling towards that ending. And, and obviously this, what you see in the finale, the fight for, for medication and, you know, Blanca stepping up in that way. And so I was like, well, if that is our last season and we know that, what the hell is this next one then? And I just could, like, we just couldn't land on something. It just didn't, nothing felt right. And I really, really, as a lover of television, I hate filler seasons. I hate yeah. watching shows where it feels like they just didn't have any intention. There was no real thrust or goal or focus. And so I think at that point, I was like, I think this is the last one. And Ryan was like, okay, then it's the last one. You know, it was, yeah. everyone was super supportive. Mm -hmm. And speaking of season two, I really want to get into Madonna's role during, during mm. this season. So the first half 
of season two is really dedicated to Vogue and Madonna's impact on in bringing this on this underground subculture to the mainstream. How did you sort of dance the line of making it clear that she did not invent voguing, yet she was incredibly responsible for bringing this culture to the mainstream? Hmm. Um, you know, honestly, it really wasn't that hard. I mean, I think that anybody who, going into season two, by that point, we had a built-in audience. So I think anyone coming in to watch the show I think wouldn't have been surprised by us saying Vogue was a song and it popularized Voguing and obviously brought uh, mainstream attention to the ballroom community. But I don't think that that was a surprise. Like I didn't have anybody, to be honest with you, I think more folks talk to me about being surprised that Madonna didn't create Vogue during the first season. Oh. So it was when the first season was airing, I think that a lot of folks were like, I had no idea that voguing was like a thing. I thought it was the Madonna song. So I think it's, you know, by the time we got to season two, I think people already realized it, you know. And what's the deal? Just her choreographers were either members of the ballroom scene or had attended balls and they just brought it to her and she popularized Well, Madonna it? lived in, in New York City in the 80s. And so she was frequenting, I mean, she was part of that downtown scene. And okay. then obviously she was hanging out with the folks who were going up to Harlem to the balls. Um, I think she was out at a, my understanding this, as the story goes, is like she was out at a club with a group of friends and she saw Jose Extravaganza, who is one of our consultants. And, yeah. you know, he played a judge on the show. Um, and he's in that first, second, or second season premiere, um, voguing at the very end of it. But I think she saw him performing mm -hmm. and was like, what is that? And like, loved it. And so out of that was the song. And Jose's in the Vogue video and he was a dancer for her. Blonde Ambition Tour. Blonde yeah. Ambition Tour. Yeah. And how, um, how did you decide to include the Blonde Ambition Tour as plot with the boys auditioning to be dancers? That was just like a fun little like Easter egg for like us and for the audience yeah. and, you know, like a little nod to to Jose. I think like for the thing for us is like audiences, we're always thinking about the audience first. And the reality is like your modern day audience loves specificity. Like those are the kinds of things that an audience mm -hmm. goes, ooh, you know, it's like like in the finale having... Uh, Ricky, played by Delon Burnside, say that he was rehearsing as a dancer for Destiny's Child. You know, it's like, those are the kinds of things that people like to hear. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, it feels, it, it makes the world feel more rich and real and familiar. And as opposed to like avoiding talking about the real world. Right. So. Speaking of speci specificity, whose idea was it to include that sex in the city scene? Jump, you were, now you were jumping in the finale to mm. 98. Mm -hmm. whose brilliant idea was that scene <laughs> uh i'm pretty sure that was ryan murphy who after we were we were like sort of at the end of breaking the, the episode and he was like i really think you should do one more time jump in the episode do not do a 98 just so that we can catch up with everybody and see where they are and it was like oh that's so smart and he was like you know it'd be really fun is if we have all the women come together and they can all sort of have like their, like a little mini sex in the city moment. And so then I think it was like Our Lady J um, was like, oh, well, you know, Sex in the City would have been out by that point if we're saying it's 98. Um, and we were like, oh, oh, we can actually like make it sort of referential. So I mean, them drinking yeah. Cosmos. I mean, that that little scene was a highlight of just because it was so it's a little inherently ridiculous but it was so funny and so specific mm -hmm. to just like what was going on um yeah okay i want to let's talk about the casting where did you find i guess i really want to talk about mj rodriguez india moore uh dominique jackson where did you mm -hmm. find those three so we have an incredible casting director alexa fogel she worked on 
uh the wire most recently she cast like atlanta so she's incredible an emmy winning casting director and specifically earmarked her because she had had the experience on the wire of casting untapped talent you know casting mm -hmm. folks who had never been in front of a camera before um and so we knew that we were going to be casting a lot of unknowns or like first time actors and so we were like let's Let's use someone who's really familiar with that process. And Alexa took six months. She went out into the ballroom community. She had her team talk to folks and just really scour, you know, New York to find really incredible talent. And so six months later, uh, she sends a casting. So this was the process for the for the pilot. Um, she sent casting tapes to the executive producer so it was ryan myself brad falchuk i think it was like six tapes per character so the characters wow. being damon it was damon blanca electra angel i think it was just those yeah it was just those four because i think we always had billy earmarked for pray tell so you know we were talking to these incredible people and specifically with the ladies, like these really incredible women who just had never been given an opportunity before, just really hadn't had their first shot yet and had lived a life, you know? And so much of their auditions really was just talking to them. I mean, the reality is like, and this is the, this is actually the truth, like this is no bullshit, but MJ Rodriguez, Dominique Jackson and India Moore, they were the three from their audition tapes that we earmarked as being our favorites. So we went in to watch, like we went into the auditions already knowing like, unless they come in and they fully bomb, mm -hmm. like it's theirs. And like, and you know, obviously we, you know, they went through a scene and, and it was like, yeah, like they just, they have, they have it, you know? And then we got to talk to them. Um, and it was, it was in that process of falling in love with them that you're like, okay, it's like, it's clearly their role. Like there's no question. And you had said um, that you, that you said to Ryan, I really think we need to cast trans women in these roles. And he was almost like, yeah, because he was shocked by that though. I, we were both shocked by, by, I think he was shocked by the question. I was shocked by his response mm -hmm. because prior to meeting Ryan the cast was a gotcha question whenever I was pitching the show. So executives more often than not were like, so who are you going to cast to play these roles? You know, and that it was always, and my response was always very um, unapologetic. I was like, I don't know. I haven't met them yet. You know, and that just never really went over very well. I think, you know, more times than not, execs were like, well, yeah, it's a cute response and you're cheeky, but no. You know, it's like, really, who are you going to cast? Mm -hmm. The show kind of lives and dies on the shoulders of these characters, especially Blanca. And so um, I was shocked. Ryan was the first person when we met. I just remember very, you know, explicitly saying to him, uh, I don't want to treat these characters like anything other than real people you know like they deserve respect they're not freak shows they're not clowns they're not a joke you know i like we need to make sure that we are humanizing who these women are um and treating them with respect and he was like obviously like he was so it was like a personal affront to him like how like why would you even say that but i, I was coming off of 166 meetings where people were just kind of like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know right and I know MJ, MJ and Dominique for sure were part of the ball, the ball community in New York City. Mm -hmm. Was there anybody else that you plucked from the community? I think they all were. So Haley was part of the ballroom community here in Los Angeles. Um, India's, I think India was part of the House of Extravaganza at that point. I wanted to, so in se season one of the show, Evan Peters, Kate Mara, James Vanderbeek, they were very prominent. Uh, they really drove a lot of the story in season one. How did mm -hmm. how did you guys come to the idea that, all right, we are going to move on from these characters and solely focus the show on the ladies and Billy Porter and the boys? It had everything to do with narrative. So, you know, we 
the story that we were telling with India Moore's character Angel in the first season was a story of um, agency. You know, we, it was really important for us, especially because, I mean, here's the truth. That character, Angel, was based on Venus Extravaganza from the documentary Paris is Burning. Yes. And for anyone who hasn't seen the doc, Venus is killed, you know, in real life. And so at the end of the documentary, you find out that she's died and it's really sad. And one of the conversations that Ryan and I had had uh, early on in the process of the first season was that we always wondered what she would have become. like who would Venus be in the world had she lived? And so that's really where the character of Angel emerged. And that's where we pulled that part of uh, Damon being a sex worker. We took that out and we made the character Angel, who's a sex worker on the piers. And then she meets, mm -hmm. you know, a John or, or Stan, who she then falls in love with. So anyway, um, once we, we broke that, you know, we decided that was gonna be part of, of Angel's arc in the first season. We spent a lot of time talking about where does that go? Obviously the audience throughout the first season was waiting for him to get violent. They were waiting for him to kill her for, you know, they, cause that's what we've always seen in film and TV that I think that's what was expected. We were telling a love story, but more than anything, we I, I felt really strongly that I wanted to tell a story of a trans woman stepping into her power, stepping into her agency, mm -hmm. not needing a man, you know, and that that story would be important for all women, whether cis or trans. Mm -hmm. So when we got to the end of the season, after we told that story and specifically that scene in the in the first season finale where he comes to the ball to like tell her I love you and I need you and mm -hmm. she's like, I'm, I'm good, I can't do that. It felt to me like we wrapped that story. And more than anything, I, and again, this is me thinking more as both a storyteller, but also like putting myself in the shoes of the audience. I just didn't want to renege on that and take that away from the audience. Like we already told a story where you get to see her have this agency and this power to have him come back in the second season as a character regardless of whether we time jumped or not, and she's still struggling in terms of her relationship to him, felt like we're stripping her of all the power that we just gave her. And so that ultimately was the reason why those characters went away. It just, it didn't feel like there was any more space for them because in reality, it's like their story was so deeply linked to, to Angel, you know? And so it was like, mm -hmm. I don't, where do we go with those characters if, you know, they're not part of ballroom? And so ultimately they, yeah. you know, they went away. Um, I'm a huge Sandra Bernhard fan and mm. I've, you know, been, I mean, well, I've been seeing her live for the past hundred years, but I remember during the first season of Pose, she, this is before she was even cast on Pose, she was telling the, the audience how much she loved this show and it was her new favorite show. Was it? Is that what got her the role? Did like one of you hear her talking about the show on the radio? And is that how her name got thrown in the mix to like maybe initially do like a cameo that then turned into like a series regular? No, um, I just should say too, uh, Sandy is like one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. Like just such a lovely human being, like very thoughtful um, and a great actor. I thought she was so brilliant in the in our series finale. Um, no, so this is how that happened. <laughs> I was on a plane flying from Los Angeles to New York, and I was seated next to Judith Light, um, incredible actor from Who's the Boss? Of course, and yeah. It was, it was in uh, American Crime Sto Story Versace. And um, she was like, you'll never guess who's on the plane. And I'm like, who? She's like, Sandra Bernhardt. I'll introduce you when, you know, when we are... Uh, you know, deplaning. And so is that a word, deplaning? Yes. So anyway, um, so we get off the plane, we're walking towards baggage, Judith in introduces me to Sandy. Um, and so we're talking and and she's like, oh, and what do you do? And I'm, and, and our lady Jay was on that flight as well. Oh, wow. um, and I was like, oh, well, you know, Jay and I are, are, you know, we're working on Pose and she was like, oh my God. She was like, love that show, such a fan. She was like, that's so exciting. And then she says to me, she did this thing that I think is really great. She just like, you know, she was decided she was gonna shoot her shot, if you will. And she was like, listen, if there's ever an opportunity for me, there's ever a place for me somewhere, just keep me in mind. What she didn't know is that we had just finished writing episode six 
of the first season and we were in the middle of casting for it. And so we, I was in New York, I forget for what, I think it was like, we we're doing like a tastemakers event for the pilot or something. And I get back to LA, I'm in the room and Ryan and I are talking and he's like, we have to get back to talking about who's gonna play. I don't even think Judy had a name yet. I think it was just like the nurse. Like mm -hmm. we need to talk about who's gonna be ner the nurse on, on the sixth episode. And I was like, oh, I was like, you know who I just met? Uh, Sandra Bernhard. And I was like, and she was really interested in, you know, she was like, I'm just a big fan and would love to do something. Um, and he was like, oh, I was like, oh, well then, okay. And then he just reached out and she was on the show. Did she, w during that second season where it was like, re you know, for the string of episodes, it really was all about the blonde ambition, you know, era of Madonna's career. I mean, she was there. I mean, she's in Truth or Dare. Like, that's when mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. were best friends. Did she ever, like, did you ever talk to her about that? That she was literally part of this Never. And you know what's so funny is like you're saying it now and I'm like, oh, I'm kicking myself in the ass. Like, oh, I should have asked her about it. No. And she's so professional. And so, you know, like yeah. she would never um, tell tales out of school. No, we never talked about it. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. As far as, you know, these these unknowns that are now these these superstars like MJ and India Moore. How I'm curious, like, how have you seen them change since becoming famous? You know, they they had they've each had these personal, like, intense, unique journeys, and now they're public figures. Um, they're they're public um actors through your words and direction. Like, how have you seen them evolve as people? I mean, they obviously have a much bigger profile now. People know who they are. Um, there was something really special and magical about that first season where nobody knew who we were and no one knew what the hell we were doing. And, you know, we, we'd be in New York just walking down streets and filming and people were like, okay, whatever. Um, I, f random story connected to that. Third season, episode two, I was shooting the scene where it's after Castle faints at the bar in the second episode. Uh, and so I was directing the scene where he's on the stretcher coming out of the ballroom being put into an ambulance. And... Um, I had, you know, it's like Billy and then uh, MJ runs out of the space um, to come and talk to him. And it was like, I don't even know, it was like maybe like one in the morning. And like all of a sudden, this woman walks by our set. Don't ask me how she got through. And like, we're about to start filming. And I and we hear, is that Blanca? And she's <laughs> screaming. And we're like, we all, everyone turns. And she's like, oh my God. Mother Blanca and like she really was like I'm meeting Blanca Evangelista it was the sweetest thing and she was like oh my god mother I love you and you are such a good mother and like it just it was it was really 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 sweet but anyway final question related to the show uh the music choices mm. that are throughout uh e each of the episodes do you write the episodes with specific songs in mind uh, yes and no. It, it really just like, so for example, the season two premiere, right? Like we knew that episode was going to be focused on Madonna's Vogue. Um, Love is the message in the mm -hmm. first season. Likewise, um, I never knew love like this before from season two. Um, in the series finale, using Diana Ross's uh, Ain't Amount High Enough for the big performance with, with Blanca and Pray Tell. You know, like those things are scripted in. And then there are moments um, like the very end of the series finale, ending it with Whitney Houston, mm -hmm. where that comes from our yeah. executive producer, Alexis Martin Woodall. So Alexis is really like our, like she's our unsung hero in that way. Mm -hmm. So we, we definitely talk about music in the room. We'll definitely, you know, occasionally we'll write songs, you know, within the script. Um, but the truth is like, we have Alexis, who's our EP. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, you know, she supervises all of our post-production and she's great. Alexis is someone who just has a real uh, wealth of knowledge and an understanding of music. And she always comes through in the clutch with like the very best choices. Like she just always somehow, she's so, in lockstep with the character and the story and you need someone like that who's looking out for you and so um 
she just will always come in and at the beginning of every season. So like this, this final season, for example, you know, she reached out to myself and to Janet mock because we were directing six out of our seven episodes and was like, Hey, you know, tell me what songs you really love and what things you would love to hear this final season. Um, You know, and then she goes off and she makes a huge master list on her own though, of like, these are all the tracks that I think could be really wonderful for moments on the show. Um, And so it's always, for me, it's always really fun to, you know, like once I've done worked on my cut of an episode to then have her sort of look at it and then see what suggestions she's going to make, mm-hmm. um, you know, what she did. So for example, like with the series finale, there was a song that was at the, that ended the episode that, and um, didn't like, it was good, but like, it didn't fully work. And Alexis was like, I have an idea, but I don't want to tell you what it is. I just want to put it in and then have you watch it. I was mm-hmm. like, okay. So she goes, she puts Whitney Houston's, you know, um, my love is your love and it's like oh my god genius Uh so i love it and i guess you know just for you now that the you know this this huge part of your life has you know well you're moving on from this huge part of your life like what are you working on now or like what's next um, truth be told, I am, I'm taking a little break cause I'm tired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and I am, I'm doing the thing that I did back in 2013, just before I wrote the first draft of Pose. So, uh, we didn't, I didn't share this with you earlier, but I, I spent 10 years working, uh, as a college professional, you know, as a college administrator. Um, and one of the things that I learned when I was in grad school working on my master's in student affairs is, you know, as a practitioner, any college campus that I step foot on, I have to assess the landscape, identify where there are gaps in programs and resources and policies, and then I need to fill those gaps. And so I bring that into my practice as a storyteller. So in 2013, I assessed the TV landscape and I saw that there was a need for stories that center black and brown queer and trans people. And that's, you know, Pose was really born out of that. And so I'm in a place right now where I'm just reassessing the Mm -hmm. television landscape. So I'm watching a lot of television and I'm just soaking it all in and, and, and paying attention and just asking myself that question, like whose story hasn't been told, whose story deserves to be centered. And then I'm going to let that inform whatever the next project is. Brilliant. I love it. You're so great. Thank you so much. It's so fun to talk to you. you. And this was was so enlightening. I I loved this. Um, This was a full circle moment for me to (laughs) sit here and chat with you since I'm such a fan of your show. And you got me through a lot of long uh, nights of shooting the final season of Pose. So thank you for having me. That is truly crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Where can people follow you on Instagram or like, are you on Twitter? Like if people want to just see what you're up to. Uh, I'm on both. And my handle is at Stephen Canals. Perfect. Guys, you can follow me, Jess XNYC, follow the show account, Hot Takes Deep Dives, and Stephen will be back with his next short and brilliant project. Thank you, Stephen. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much.